Good morning, this is Judy Gula from Artistic Artifacts. We're located in Alexandria, Virginia and on the web at artisticartifacts.com. So good morning, it is 9.30 on the East Coast and we're recording a little kind of quick uh, demonstration about dyeing. One of the things that Artistic Artifacts is known for uh, is dyeing vintage textiles. I use them in my work, I think it gives them new life. I've been doing dyeing for years and years and years. I think uh, I did a science experiment in elementary school with natural dyes and uh, won an award. So it goes way back to elementary school. I also had the privilege of being part of a study group when I was a weaver. We had really study groups and did a lot of dyeing and I'll show you some of those samples uh, as we work our way down the work, board, work area. So we do run a class. We've been able to do it because we do have a warehouse space, which you see now is uh, quite large. And um, so it allows us to do some classes out, out in this area with this air circulating and things. So we did hold classes this summer. And one of them is a dye class uh, that's mixing different colors. And another one is an indigo bat dyeing class. So we've run both of those. So we get qu asked questions about how do I do this? Well, this is my Bible right here, Color by Accident by Ann Johnston. And I'm sorry if you're an author of a dye book, but this is the only one you need. This is be able to give you some ideas on um, dyeing at home. This book is currently out of print. Ann Johnston has a website. She actually is giving the book away free. I mean, which is completely amazing. She has a video that you can purchase that is kind of, she says, oh, there's information you need that's in the video that's not, wasn't in the book. But she gave me enough information based on this book to be dangerous. And uh, I will tell you, I, I wing it. I totally, completely wing it. But she gave me the basis of how to set it up, basically a parfait, and I'm gonna show you that. She's done a couple of different things. She's converted dye powder to tablespoons. I always did weights. I always had weighted material. I always, you know, so she really made some conversions to um, weight of the material, the dye, and mixing it, and brought it down to kind of like kitchen science, um, which I think is amazing because I was in it when you had to weigh the grams of the dye and each dye has a different weight, da 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 I could go on and on. So this is about being fun. This is about being creative in colors and have it be magic when, when you take it out of the dryer when it's done. So have, those are your expectations. If you are interested in dyeing and repeatable colors and creating a business based on that, I can point you to some teachers. So you can always email me. That's, that is um, a whole different ball game. But right now, this is about the surprise of colors mixing. And as I said, this is the Bible. And you can see all my note cards falling out. <laughs> I take information out of the book and write it in a card um, so that it's handy and I, I can pull it out. So this is the basis of the class. So I'm gonna show you a couple of things. First of all, very quickly about how I mix dye powder. Now I should have uh, a mask on at least. I am not very sensitive to much of anything. I, you know, you have to be aware of your health and what is going on. I should at least have a dust mask on because I'm working with powders. Powders are when the dyes are toxic and can get into your system. I'm mixing two, so don't tell anybody that I'm doing this without a mask because I can't talk through the mask either. So um, please be aware that there is lots of information about safety. I would say Pro Chemical and Dye has information on their website and I would highly recommend them as, as being a legitimate uh, place to get information about that and buy the safety product okay so this is just for an example we have these tablespoons I think somebody got them at world world market for me they are awesome because it allows 
the die to go in. Whereas a round tablespoon is not gonna allow you and you're gonna have stuff on the top. So this, I can actually take the die, go like this, and I have less on me. So the next setup is I usually have cardboard. I have a wet piece of fabric because I wanna trap any missing dye particles that may fly from my tablespoon or my jar. So that's important as well, and it's kind of contained. So we have urea, which are like little pebbles, and there's a tablespoon. I think, she, I think Anne tells you to put more in there, but enough, a, a tablespoon for me is, is works. This is a wetting agent. It also kind of acts as, as a mixing agent too. I know when I can't hear the urea balls, I, um, I know I've got a pretty good mix. Okay, so I'm on my wet surface. I always set my jars up. So I have my jar, I have my die. I have my jar, I have my die. It's already marked and labeled before I go forward with making the die. So, and I am not very exact because I don't need to be. See, isn't that the best tablespoon you've ever seen in your life? I always have a jar because again, we're all, see, you can see that there, there, you, something always escapes, never fails. So you do need to be careful about that. So, uh, hang on one sec, I'll be back. So I have two tablespoons of dye to one, ta one cup of water. I usually use warm water. Our tap water gets very warm. Usually have lids handy. I want to make sure I'm mixed. It's always helpful to have a couple of wet fabric rags around, and you you know I'll end up using them. I'll, I'll end up uh, putting them in the dye bath, but you can see it's really kind of good to have that. All right, so now I'm ready for the next color, one cup of water, and I'm only going to do two of these because about keeping the powder under control. Once you have dye in a liquid form, it is non-toxic. At least for me, it's not. Um, again, I'm not very sensitive. Only my feelings are sensitive, but not my skin and my, um, I'm very, very lucky with that. Okay, so that's mixing powder. I tell you, it's never been any easier than this. Um, in our class, we talk a little bit about the strength of the dye powder, strength of the colors, and that type of stuff, and, and they can see it when they start using it. So um, in the class, the colors and dyes are already mixed for them, and it's, um, we just kind of have a discussion like we just did right now. Okay, so um, I have dye left from a class. You can use, this has no soda ash in it, so it does have a little bit of length. Say in the heat of the summer, I would have put it in a refrigerator. When you take, you can take it out of the refrigerator, let it return to room temperature, and then you can use it. And it's good for a couple of weeks. Again, we're not being predictable. We're not going for a specific color that we want. So we can use these.
Now the whole concept is based on a parfait and the interactions of colors moving up and down. So we start with mason jars and there is a difference in the result that you're gonna get depending on the jar. Um, plastic bags, larger jars are gonna give you a little more solid colors. These are gonna give you some action between the layers and we're gonna do three layers, all right? Um, I have some trim in the bottom there and these are pretty much fat quarter sizes of fabric. So here we go. It's all been wet. Everything has been rinsed. See, you can see I still had orange on my hands, but there you go. It's all handled. And I'm just going to put it in was here. Was it rinsed in soda ash? Yes, there was a little bit of soda ash water that it was rinsed. I'm not pounding it down. I'm pulling, I'm putting some air in there. So about a quarter of a yard, and then I'm gonna put that in. So generally, what's really nice about this process as well is if you're using a quarter of a yard, you're using a quarter cup of dye and a quarter cup of water. Because what we mixed was called a stock solution. So that means I now have a half a cup of liquid that I'm gonna pour into my jar. All right, so that's my first color. And again, technically, I'm supposed to wait a little while, but I can never wait. Um, then I take what is a stronger soda ash, nine tablespoons to a gallon, and I am going to pour a quarter of a cup, half a cup, doesn't really matter how much. You want to make sure you do it. Soda ash is cheap, and it is what's going to fix the dye to the fabric. So say I'm doing something and I get called away, which is very normal, happens all the time. I will um, come back and I'll be like, did I put soda ash in? Always put more soda ash in. You never, never want to forget this because then everything will wash out if you don't have the soda ash. So it's cheap and easy. Okay, so each layer is fabric, dye, soda ash. And I like trims and things in there. That's what I do. All right. So the first layer was gold yellow. I'm gonna use some royal blue as my next layer. Where's my water? Oh, my water's back there, Chris. Um, uh, that plastic, the apple container, apple plastic apple container. <clears throat> Thanks. All right. I'm going to pour that in. See, you can see it moving down to the next layer. I'm going to put... And that's what we want. We want this interaction to occur between the different layers. Quarter inch, quarter cup of soda ash. And then, and I am squishing it down as I put the first layers in, as the next layers are in there. And I, I just don't worry about picking up dye colors and different things. All right, so this jar is a little bit full. Cool. 
Will the complementary colors make mud? Um, yes, it will. It'll make a really, really awesome brown. So um, I know we say mud, um, but a mixed brown is always better than out of the container brown. Um, so yes, complementary colors will make a really gorgeous brown. And Jen said to have faith. <laughs> It always looks horrible in the jar. <laughs> you really can't tell from the jar. All right, and this jar is kind of, kind of full. All right. Yes, and I, I have rolls and rolls of the seam binding. And I put that in because it's a really easy, you know, all of our, inspiration packs are done this way we've had a couple of treasure boxes that have been done as um, uh, this is the way that we die so francis kushner says i love this i took your dye class three times last year and really want to see the process from the beginning thank you oh great yeah, I kind of bring everybody in from the middle because I don't want them worrying about the powder. Okay, there it is. You don't shake it, you don't move it, you don't rock and roll it. It sits overnight and then I wash everything in my washing machine. So it's, um, once you've added the soda ash, you're now fixing it to the fabric. So it is good, it's okay to go, you know, water your plants, down the drain, it's all not a problem to do any of that. So it sits overnight. I pour, I'm lucky I have a utility tub, so I pour out the excess dye and then I just put it in my washing machine. So I use Synthropol. Synthropol will take the excess dye away and take it out of the water and then it will um, wash it down the sink and it's, it's good to go. I wash twice in my washing machine, full cycles, one tablespoon, two tablespoons of, so, of a Synthropol, and I do it twice in hot. And then I put everything in the dryer. My trims and things, sometimes I hang them and let them dry that way, but most everything goes in the dryer. I want to actually you know, be abusive to the fabrics and the things that I have before you get them. So it kind of, you know, if we have, I, cause we dye all of things. A lot of the textiles, everything is pre-washed, which I didn't say that at the beginning. I pre-wash all of it. The textiles, the doilies, the fabric. Um, I don't always use prepared for fat dye fabric. I pick light print fabrics, white on white, blue on blue, um, ugly fabric. Sometimes it stays ugly, sometimes it gets better. So there's, you know, I just use, uh, we just have bins and bins. So we don't have it really well lighted. But if Kyle can show you, this is where we store our stuff to be dyed. So we have bins of silk fabric, we have bins of doilies, we have bins of trims, we have, um, you know, just bins, bins, bins. Do you wash in hot or cold fabric? Um, pre-wash, I pre-wash. Oh, um, pre-wash in warm, uh, generally. And then, then when I'm rinsing out the dye, it's always hot. I always wash two complete cycles in hot. So, you know, you, in your washing machine cycle, you don't do just rinse only. Do wash, rinse, spin. Wash, rinse, spin. Two complete cycles. Only with Synthropol. Not any other kind of detergent or anything. That's all you need is Synthropol. What other questions do we have? What's our time frame? I think you've got 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes. Okay. So, um, no questions so far? Okay, we'll just do another jar. I am, I am definitely not fussy about um, my, my containers, my cups. I just, just go with it. It's, it's, uh, so this piece is a little bit bigger. So another way you can do, and you can start folding things. I, you know, you can do your tie-dye, you can do your, your clips, all of that stuff. So let's see, we'll start with, we'll do some orange. Somebody wants to know if you can use Dawn. Uh, no. 
only use center ball. Now I need to Do see. you have to worry about the next normal load of wash getting dye on it? Nope. That's why you're running it through twice. Is the mason jar a quart size? Uh, I think so. Yeah, 800 milliliters. I think it's a quart size. Centipal only in the pre and post washes. What about linen? I do everything the same way. I do all materials the same way. So it doesn't, if I'm going to dye it, I'm, I'm going to do the pre and post um, washing the same way. All right. Gonna use. So Frances wants to know if she brought some of her fabrics in where she got a uh, brown. Could you help her replicate how she got those? No. <laughs> I can't. Oh I'm, I can never replicate anything. We can attempt by using mixed, you know, using the complementary colors is always going to give you the brown. I will tell you that we normally start every class with six colors. Sun yellow, gold yellow, turquoise, blue, turkey red, and fuchsia. So those are what we start everybody out on, and you mix your own colors. So that would be the place to start, Francis. All right, so I have some yellow in there. I have some orange. Let's see what else we have to do. So. We brought out some of the samples. Oh, great. Thank you, Leslie. Awesome. All right, so we'll show you some of the results. Let's see what else I can stuff in here. <laughs> so you definitely want your, your fabric to be wet. Dry fabric does not conduct dye. So what happens with dye, dry fabric is it actually is going to resist the dye. So um, that's something that you want to make sure it's wet all the way through and then wring it out. And I pre-wet uh, it in some, something with about two tablespoons of soda ash. All right. The torture is not um, mushing and not shaking and not um, making sure that you just let the dye do the movement. That's what you want. You want it wicking and, and all that stuff. Um, I'm looking for something. For my hands. I have little samples from silk and that kind of stuff too. Okay, so let's see how much we can get in here. So, cause I still need to add soda ash. There's um, a question about um, how long once you've mixed your dyes, are they stable until your next dye session? They are um, stable for a, about a couple of weeks. Uh, if you are in a, an environment that is very um, hot and dry, then you're gonna wanna put them in the um, refrigerator. And that, that'll help keep them. Because what happens is you're going to, this is, it's kind of a chemical reaction with heat. So, um, you know, ideally we tell everybody, drive them around with the back of your trunk for, you know, a few hours and, and that heat is gonna help it bond. Then you're going to, um, take the dye out of the refrigerator and let it return to room temperature, not actually use it cold. That was, that's one of the things that you want to not do. Another question. Uh -huh. If dry fabric repels the dye, yep. could you use that to your advantage when yep. creating the piece? Will it completely repel the dye? It will completely repel the dye. So say you want to get some some you want to use that as a resist. I would say you want to try maybe soaking your fabric. Um, you could then put hang it to dry a little bit until it's somewhat damp. 
and then put it in. Or you could put, um, you could take a paintbrush and put soda ash and paint it type of thing. So yes, you can use your resist. Do you ever use ice? I have not used ice. So ice dyeing, there's lots of instructions online about it. And one of the best things about ice dyeing is you were literally taking your powder and you are having water go through the powder. So now you're doing powder, which is 100% very intense dye. So it gives you some really brilliant re situations of color. And there's great instructions out there. I have no clue why I haven't tried it because I love to dye. And I see lots and lots of um, things that people show me and they get some great, great results. But it is, it does have to do with that fact that you're starting with powder and you're having ice and it's going through. So yes, try it, try it. Do you um, ever do gradations of a single color in a jar? You can. Um, we have that request a lot in class and we, you can do that. What you're going to do, you usually start with the dark on the bottom. You're gonna use less dye, more water as you go up. The other thing that happens is uh, whenever I, some, somebody's like, oh, I just want to put one color in the jar. Well, they have to do the first three jars my way and then they can do what they want. But even one color means you're going to do royal blue and indigo blue, red, blue, and fuchsia. So I never really just put one color in. And Ann Johnson, who's Bible that you use actually on Instagram. She showed recently this week how she was dyeing some gradations on a table. Oh, so maybe great. you could go oh, and see, yeah. watch her Instagram post. That's definitely, I'm telling you, I, I never met her. I would love to meet her. I've talked to her on the phone and emailed her, but I would love to take a class from her. Let me pull this up. So Ellen says that there was a class where they boiled, um, but they were wool. That was with eco dyeing, right? Yeah, eco dyeing has to require steaming. Um, notice Leslie's shirt. We gotta get Leslie's shirt in there. Because we are a Bernina dealer. Yes, we are. And we are gonna be able to sell you Bernina feet soon, October 1st, online. We're so excited. Um, so yes, there, you, wool is mostly acid, an acid dye specifically. Eco dyeing uses um, steam as well. When uh, you do shibori, which we've done with pole wrapping and pleating, that's hot, that's steamed, and that's what keeps those pleats in. So this is, requires a little more information. I have dyed wool with my Procyon MX, but it is designed for natural fibers, um, vegetable fibers. Cotton, um, it will dye silk. You have to just watch your soda ash with silk. Um, rayon, it will dye anything, um, but definitely it's more cotton, linen, t you know, uh, stuff rather than animal fibers, which is wool. Um, all right. So my niece learned my dyeing method and uh, has actually for several years been in charge of this part of the business so she's created some new colors that you can find online which uh, we show some photographs she is off to college and we'll miss Celia but we'll get to see her at holidays but she's she's actually been taking care of this part of the business for a couple of years it's been her own she's been designing the the inspiration packs and um, we've been adding them to the website so you can still get them. So in our inspiration packs, you get a couple of fat quarter-ish sizes of fabric. You get maybe a napkin, a hanky, a little bit of trim, and they are usually color coordinated and tied together. Maybe I'll tie with this one. So while she's showing that, all the supplies are on our website under dyes. Right. Dyes, auxiliaries, and PFD prepared for dyeing fabric. And you um, need uh, urea, the dye, and soda ash, and synthropol. That's what you need. So um, we do have a good selection of colors. 
that we use. And it, as you can tell, I definitely go to the brights. Um, I definitely use a medium amount of dye to get the color that I want. So if you want lighter colors, you use less dye, a little more water in your half a cup. And if you want stronger colors, then you're going to use more dye and less water. So it, it, it's really easy. It's very, very easy. I used to do this on top of my washing machine. <laughs> So, can confirm that. Yes, you can confirm <laughs> that, can't you? Um, so it's been great. What other questions are there? Um, I know we've had requests to do this as an online class. I haven't quite gotten up to speed on online classes, and I, I have to um, definitely put some energy into that idea. And I know we've been there's been several requests for different classes, a beading class, a book class, and dyeing classes, and and I promise you, I keep saying, as I get through the next event, which we have a great big event in October, we have a yard sale in the 25th, we have an event on the indigenous holiday, and so we, we have these things that are store only participation coming up. So as soon as we get through that. <laughs> so a couple more comments. Okay. Um, Suzanne says, I took Judy's classes several times over the years and I'm completely hooked. <laughs> And Frances bought a bolt of Kona cotton. Yes, she and did. And she's ready to go. <laughs> she is. I did do my shirt. So we do have people that come in and um, we save the big pieces till the end. So sorry, I moved too fast for Kyle. <laughs> um, and this, we actually held it and poured it. So there is lots of ways you can fold, you can pour, you can rubber band, all of that kind of stuff. But again, for me, it's all about the surprise. So what I'll do is over the next week, I'll do a couple more jars and I'll show you what happened to them next week. We'll have them um, out so you can see what the process is. The good, bad, and the ugly. I, you know, we don't know what's gonna happen, but it's gonna be fun. So. One final question mm -hmm. is, would you repeat the soda ash concentrations again, please? So I pre-soak my fabric in about one to two tablespoons of soda ash to a gallon of water in a bin. And then the large one that I use at, in the jar is nine tablespoons of soda ash to a gallon of water. So it's much more concentrated. And that is in the book. So she, I get taking these strictly right out of Ann Johnson's book. And a final comment is from Megan. Nicole, yes. who says, I remember doing this with you in high school. This was a great <laughs> refresher. <laughs> Megan, yes, you do remember. We, we dragged you through everything. Megan was in my first group of interns with my son, Kyle. So we had, I guess, four or five high school students that were interns here at Artistic Artifacts. I would love to have that again. It was wonderful. All right, have a great day. Have a creative day. Please join us, Facebook, Instagram, store, online. Okay, just join us. <laughs> have a great day.